All right, everyone. So today I'm speaking with Emil Torres. They are a philosopher and historian. They have a bunch of works on Salon, at Salon's websites uh, over the theory of long-termism, which we'll be discussing today. Most recent article that came out was on August 20th called Understanding Long-Termism, Why This Suddenly Influential Philosophy is So Toxic. Highly recommend that piece and we'll include it in the description box below. And they also have a forthcoming book called Human Extinction, a history of the science and ethics of annihilation. So uh, I was thinking, first of all, let's try to dive into what long-termism exactly is. Because the way I understand it is basically we as human beings have no intrinsic value whatsoever. We really only exist to make sure that we create a multi-planetary species that expands throughout uh, the exoplanets that are in the Virgo supercluster, so in surrounding galaxies, basically. And so that can have like some sci scientific science fiction allure to people, but could you go into um, some of the more like nefarious aspects of that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think that is one uh, interpretation of it. Um, I think the, probably the most straightforward argument for long-termism comes from uh, a particular ethical theory called total utilitarianism. And that does see people as uh, not having any intrinsic value, but merely having derivative value. So it's by virtue of the fact that we can bring intrinsic value into the universe. So that would be w well-being, um, which might be interpreted as pleasure or you know, satisfied desires or, or something along those lines. Uh, and then from that, uh, and then you know, the, the, the core of this ethical theory says that the greater the total amount of value there is in the universe as a whole, the better the universe will be. And so one way to increase total value is to make the happiness of those people who currently exist uh, greater. You know, but another way uh, is to just add more people, <laughs> you know, so that's a that's a second means of increasing total value. Um, but I think, you know, not long termism doesn't have to be built on that uh, foundation. I mean, as long as one thinks that a universe with more uh, happy people is better than a universe with fewer happy people, then you sort of get the, the long-termist view. So really, long-termism is what happens when the effective altruism uh, community collides with uh, the astronomical waste argument first put forward by Nick Bostrom. And so to, to unpack that, um, the, you know, effective altruism emerged like, you know, around 2008, 2009. And the central task of uh, effective altruism was to figure out, use the tools of science and evidence and reason to determine the best ways to do the most good. And so initially it was focused on alleviating global poverty. So, you know, it, it turns out that, you know, maybe donating to um, uh, disaster relief actually doesn't do the most good. A lot of that money ends up kind of getting wasted or, you know, this and that. So if you crunch the numbers, it turns out that the best way to do the most good, to save the most lives, is actually to spend that money on uh, mosquito bed nets, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which then you can send to uh, individuals in areas, regions of the world that are susceptible to um, malaria. And so, that yeah, that was the initial focus of EA, effective altruism. Earlier, uh, back in 2003, Nick Bostrom put forward this argument that if you're a total utilitarian, um, what you should uh, care about more than anything, your top four priorities are reducing existential risk. The fifth priority is to colonize space uh, as much as possible. And why is that? Well, part of the definition of an existential risk is any event that would uh, permanently prevent us from spreading into the universe and creating astronomical amounts of value. 
How could we do that? Well, as soon as we spread the space, the human population could expand. You know, again, people on this, on this, in this particular argument, people are the containers of value. So the more containers you have with net positive amounts of value, the more total value. And he goes even further and says, you know, not only could we spread throughout, you know, the Virgo supercluster, and in, you know, uh, in, in um, you know, live on all these exoplanets. Uh, uh, you know, spread throughout, but also um, you might be able to actually fit more people or value containers inside simulated universes. So really what we should want to do is to spread into space, convert uh, the various resources that uh, there are out there, our, our uh, you know, cosmic endowment of, of, of resources. So, you know, convert an exoplanet, for example, into computronium, into a giant computer, that can then run simulations that contain even more people, digital people. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was his argument in 2003. Meanwhile, you have the effective altruism movement emerging again around like 2009. And they're going, okay, well, we really want to do the most good. They encounter Bostrom's argument and they go, oh my gosh, there could be an enormous number of people in the future. So Bostrom calculated, I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like maybe 10 to the 38 uh, I digital. I think I remember from your piece, it was like 10 to the to the 58th power amount of people, something like yeah. that. Yeah. So that was the number he came up with, mm. with later, but that's exactly right. Mm. I mean, that was just an updated figure mm. um, that, and, you know, I think that was based on the assumption that we could um, colonize the, the entire uh you know, accessible universe, not mm -hmm. just the Virgo supercluster, which is just a little, well, it's a large neighborhood mm -hmm. of a whole bunch of galaxies. Um, and so, yeah, so then you have these vectors going, well, wow, if there could be an enormous number of people in the future, maybe the best way to do the most good is to focus on not just um, ensuring that their lives are good, but ensuring that they come into existence in the first place, <laughs> you know, because again, mm -hmm. a universe with more people that are happy is better than a universe with fewer people that are happy on this particular view. And so that's where you get long-termism. And yeah, so you, you have these vector altruists then who are getting really excited about, you know, calculating how many people there could be, you know, McCaskill and Hillary Graves, um, uh, who are both affiliated with the Future of Humanity Institute that Bostrom mm -hmm. founded in 2005, they borrow numbers from a colleague of theirs and say, which which uh, states that there could be 10 to the 45 digital people in the Milky Way galaxy alone. So that's just an enormous number of people, an enormous amount of potential value in the future. And really, if you want to do the most good, you should therefore focus on ensuring that these people come into existence, ensuring that we colonize space and convert exoplanets into giant computers where people live in virtual reality worlds. Yeah, I, I was actually familiar with the effective altruist argument, specifically the one about how mosquito bed nets are more effective than disaster relief. That This was commonly discussed in some philanthropy courses that I took in undergrad. Now, of course, this leads into the crux of the issue, which is even if that sounds all good and well, uh, when you have so much of global poverty relief, let's say, natural disaster relief, disease relief, et cetera, reliance on a small group of people, then they can be co-opted and influenced by someone like Nick Bostrom, who has some problematic ideals, and we'll go into that, but it's important for people to note that the astronomical waste paper that you mentioned has been retweeted by Elon Musk, and Elon Musk has actually retweeted a lot of Bostrom's works. And, you know, in fact, just on the, let's see here, I have it. Yeah, on August 25th, uh, Musk once again posted, population collapse due to low birth rates is a much bigger risk to civilization than global warming. Mark these words. Now, with Bostrom himself, it seems like his biggest concern, and correct me if I'm wrong, and of course go deeper into it, is his biggest concern seems to be, well, yes, ideally we want to expand the amount of humans that exist, but we also have to be careful that undesirable traits uh, do not 
get passed down to like these offspring basically. And my understanding is that this also has some origins with uh, the eugenics movements, uh, early eugenics movement, especially in the UK. So could could you tie all that together? Yeah, that's that's straightforwardly a eugenic concern. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he mentioned that in a paper where he's discussing existential risk. Uh, and an existential risk is not just human extinction. You know, that's one way we could fail to colonize space and simulate huge numbers of digital people and therefore bring an enormous amount of of impersonal value into the universe. But, you know, there are all sorts of survivable scenarios as well. So maybe, for example, technology stagnates. Well, since we need technology to colonize space, that could be, you know, an existential uh, catastrophe. And so, and then there are various others that are sort of, you know, obviously civilization could collapse as a result of, you know, an asteroid impact or a volcanic super eruption, or maybe, you know, something more speculative like um, uh, self-replicating nanobots that uh, uh, devour the entire biosphere, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, scenario called uh, ecophagy or or the Grey Goo uh, scenario. And, you know, so those are also, examples of existential risks, but also since it seems that we need a certain degree of intellectual ability in order to achieve these these ends, uh, grand cosmic ends, uh, if it's the case, he argues that people who are less intellectually talented uh, outbreed people who are more intellectually talented, then you get a less smart uh, human population. And from his view, that could be bad because that could, again, impede uh, our ability to you know, spread into space and uh, generate astronomical amounts of value. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's so ba- you know, Bostrom initially proposed the notion of existential risk in the, con- the specific context of transhumanism. Mm-hmm. So initially, his his definition in 2002, so a year before the astronomical waste paper, um, he defined existential risk specifically in transhumanist terms. So it's any event that would prevent us from establishing a flourishing and stable post-human civilization. You know, where a post-human is some uh, individual that's been modified, maybe through genetic engineering or through you know brain machine interfaces you know neural uh, implants uh, and so on in some way that makes them gives them a, a kind of superhuman capacity maybe they live forever or they're super intelligent or something like that so an existential risk is any event that would prevent us from creating this civilization of uh, post humans and so and be, and he's actually explicit about the the transhumanist roots of his philosophical thinking about the future of humanity. There's, a, I think, a New Yorker article where he uh, discusses this. It also mentions that, for example, he signed up with Alcor uh, mm-hmm. to have, I, I don't know if it's if it's his head and neck or it's his entire body frozen once he dies in hopes of then being revived later on by some mm-hmm. you know, future technology. But the whole point of mentioning that is transhumanism definitely emerged out of the Anglo-American eugenics tradition. So you know, the term, a lot of people think Julian Huxley, who was mm-hmm. uh, for a time from, I think, 1959 to, to 1962, the president of the British Eugenic Society. Uh, a lot of people think that he coined the term, but he didn't coin the term. Uh, nonetheless, he did popularize it uh, in the second half of the, the 20th century. Uh, and yeah, so so he you know was, a, was an early transhumanist. Uh, and a eugenicist, and you know, there's an obvious overlap there. It's it's about for, for him the worry is that the human species might degenerate, uh, and so you know maybe there are ways to again use the tools of of science and and technology to prevent degeneration from happening, or even more, perhaps we could use that technology to. Uh, radically enhance ourselves to to create you know this kind of superhuman or superhuman or posthuman uh, species, and that you know would be very good from his perspective. But I mean, he was talking even though he didn't 
use the word transhumanism uh, earlier than, I can't remember what it was, maybe it was the 1960s that he first popularized it. But I mean, he was talking about this idea in a book from, I think it was the 1920s called uh, Religion Without Revelation. And so he, that that's sort of presenting this kind of scientific humanism or this kind of transhumanist uh, view about what we how we ought to use technology to modify ourselves. And it's it's worth maybe just underlining the uh, the title, which is is very revealing. I mean, what he wanted was a replacement for religion. You know, he's he's an atheist or an agnostic. I can't remember uh, which it was. Uh, so are a lot of transhumanists. So there's sort of this void where, where you know, religion used to, that re religion used to occupy since religion is no longer seen as scientifically, uh, uh, no longer seen as, as tenable given, you know, advancements in uh, science or scientific knowledge of the universe. Uh, yeah, there's this, this whole, this lacuna left over. And so the whole point of transhumanism was to provide like, okay, so the, to, to, um, uh, the whole point of transhumanism was to say maybe the promises made by religion, for example, a future heaven on earth, could actually still be realizable. It's just we ourselves will have to create it rather than rely on supernatural agency uh, to establish it here. And Bostrom himself in, in the, the 1999 transhumanist frequently asked questions which was kind of, it was written with input from a whole bunch of, of transhumanists at the time. Many of them were called extropians. Um, and he, there is a section where he also is like pretty explicit that the parallels between transhumanism and religion are uh, not a coincidence. <laughs> you know, that this mm. sort of is a replacement for, uh, for what was left behind by uh, religion. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, but yeah, so the point is that transhumanism has roots in eugenics and you sort of see that in Bostrom mentioning or identifying quote unquote dysgenic pressures mm -hmm. as one possible existential risk scenario alongside you know nuclear conflict and runaway climate change and so on mm. yeah no and actually the idea of transhumanism supplanting religion makes me think of that old aphorism about Stalin of how he didn't hate religion he just hated competition <laughs> and it, it it definitely has uh so, some remnants of that and so uh, another thing before we just dive deeper into the theory itself and some of the key players I definitely want to do that I want to first of all just go over the future of humanity institutes so my understanding is that it's basically a think tank that's located in Oxford, so pretty prestigious. Um, could you just go into like how um, also maybe just go into maybe it's, it's like it's funding mechanisms as well. Like how is it set up as an organization? Is it a nonprofit technically? I'm just curious. You know, I'm not I'm not sure about some of those details. Mm -hmm. um, it was I think I'd mentioned it was set up in 2005 by uh by bostrom i sort of have no idea how he managed to do that uh because mm -hmm. he he wasn't a particularly well-known scholar at the time uh i know that he had applied for some jobs that he, he didn't end up getting uh but somehow was able to uh to coax individuals at oxford into uh allowing him to establish this this organization and I think it's it's part of the Oxford Martin School. I, I might be wrong about that, but anyways, I mean, it. I don't know where like the initial funding came from. Uh, that's that's an interesting question. That would be, uh, yeah, maybe useful to to know. But since then, I mean, it's it's gotten, I think, a million dollars from the Future of Life Institute. Uh, which is part of a donation given to the Future of Life Institute, which is sort of a sister institute, but based in Boston, uh, by Elon Musk. So Elon Musk gave him $10 million, a million went to FHI. And I think it also gets a lot of its funding from open philanthropy. So, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, there's just, there's a lot of connections there with billionaires. And so a huge amount of money uh, uh, that's behind uh, that organization. 
And so initially, like the, you know, Bostrom, as I understand it, Bostrom was was sort of doing his own thing with the Future Humanity Institute. Effective altruism, you know, uh, formed uh, and coalesced sort of independent of that. And then it was it was kind of, a, you know, around maybe 2010 or so that these two ID, these two, you know, institutes and and institute on one side, movement on the other, sort of made contact, and again, that sort of gave rise to the the long termist worldview. So, you know, right now the effective altruism community has forty six point one billion in committed funding, and they've you know made all sorts of connections with uh, billionaires, and you know, long termism is is very ubiquitous in uh, the tech industry. Uh, you know, long-termism also sort of has roots in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, because uh, arguably an early uh, long-termist before the term was coined was not just Bostrom, but Eliezer Yudkowsky, uh, who founded the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which was initially funded by Peter Thiel. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's uh, one way I, I think about it, and so this is maybe helps to explain or properly contextualize uh, for listeners why they may be seeing a lot of stuff about long-termism right now is you can sort of distinguish between two phases of, of promoting this ideology. Sort of phase one was behind the scenes stuff. And so that was establishing connections with, you know, super wealthy individuals, uh, you, you know, in California, uh, not just billionaires like uh, like Elon Musk, but also, you know, one of the, the top donors to the Future of Life Institute, which is a, a long-termist organization, uh, is Sam Harris. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, this sort of phase, and it also, you know, at the same time, long-termists ha have successfully infiltrated a lot of uh, governments. <laughs> so, you know, there's long-termists in the U.S. government. Some have held very high positions there. There are, you know, U U.K. reports that have been, uh, that have been, um, where, you know, Toby Ord, who's one of the, the main uh, leading long-termists at the Future Man Institute, has consulted on them. And then the United Nations is, <laughs> uh, in according to a, a U.N. dispatch, uh, article and podcast is increasingly a long-termist organization and, you know, foreign policy is being shaped by long-termist ideas. And the upcoming 2023 summit for the future is, or at least it seems, will be greatly uh, 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 influenced by uh, long-termism as well. So that was sort of phase one. And phase two is just now they're trying to go public mm -hmm. and to convince, you know, the uh, the, the general public that they should also subscribe to this ideology, but they've already kind of spread the tentacles of power and influence, you know, throughout, uh, you know, governments, like I said, the tech industry. And so now it's, it's just sort of convincing the, the average person that they shouldn't be afraid of long-termists running for political office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, definitely. And I also think that just looking at some of the other members who are part of the Future of Humanity Institute, there is a, this is to me, honestly, it sounds a lot like a hyper-capitalist dystopia where uh, pretty much every potential like human atrocity can be rationalized and can be looked at by applying market incentives to it. So the, the biggest example that I can think of, and I'm I would want you to expand more on, on this person, but is a uh, Robin Hansen, and another member of Future of Humanity Institute. And there was this one piece in your article where he says that well, the biggest issue with the Holocaust was that there weren't enough Nazis because theoretically he says. If you had one hundred thousand, if you had every Jew willing to pay a hundred thousand dollars to stop the Holocaust, and then every Nazi willing to pay one hundred dollars to go along with it, then will the Holocaust get, give you a five point four uh, billion dollar consumer surplus, right? So yeah. <laughs> maybe you know if we're looking at trade offs, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, that does seem though to be a, a common theme throughout, though, like the idea of well, there aren't really solutions. 
there are trade-offs if we have the right incentives and eventually in the long term we'll have the right outcomes <laughs> yeah i think the the way that the F fhi people future Vanity institute uh, individuals approach ethics for example is very much influenced by economics and you know historically i'm not sure it's a coincidence that utilitarianism which we were discussing earlier emerged around the same time as you know capitalism and you know during the the industrial revolution and because you know both are very quantitative uh human beings uh, be, by virtue of us being value containers you know we're just these sort of fungible entities you know replaceable mm -hmm. <laughs> you know ultimately and because again our value is just just derivative it just has to do with how much uh pleasure or or whatever you take value to be we introduce into the universe and so yeah it's it's very um there's very much a kind of economic mindset which I, i'm not even sure the people at fhi are fully aware of just how how much th this is the extent to which this is not obviously in a, an objectively correct way of thinking about things. I mean, it's just one, you know, particular way that, you know, is is perhaps not surprising that they would embrace it, uh, given the fact that they're, you know, well, they, they tend to be well, relatively well off uh, white people in the West. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it, 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 I do find it disturbing the extent to which uh, people like Robin Hansen tend to think about these issues within this this economic framework uh, where you know people are just sort of reduced to uh, you know th their their usefulness, their sort of instrumental value. I mean, a good example of this is I, which I mentioned in the article is Hansen's uh, a, a couple of passages in Hansen's contribution to the uh, two thousand eight. Uh, edited collection ca called Global Cat Catastrophic Risks, which was co-edited by Bostrom. And, you know, Hansen says, well, you know, maybe, um, you know, industrial civilization might collapse. Uh, if that happens, then what we want to do, of course, he assumes is rebuild industrial civilization. This is this is a, a view that's sort of widely held by the long termists. You could see it in Will McCaskill's recent book. It's very important that we go through, that if civilization collapses, we pass through another industrial revolution to get back to the particular level of technological development uh, that uh, currently exists. Why does that matter? Well, uh, because it seems that industrial civilization is a stepping stone for us to colonize space and, you know, create this, this you know, a, a huge multi-planetary in, intergalactic civilization that brings all this you know, impersonal value into the world. And so basically Hansen says that, okay, if uh, civilization does collapse, how is it that we can actually rebuild? Well, one way is we put people in uh, refuges or, you know, like it, uh, an example would be an underground bunker. And then the, the so Matt, you know, Perhaps civilization collapses, and we end up like in a hunter-gatherer type uh, state, <laughs> you know, where we just have to hunt for food and you know forage berries and so on, uh, or maybe we're just kind of in this agricultural state. So, in he, on the way he reasons is, it might actually be good to take some contemporary hunter-gatherers and put them in these bunkers, or some contemporary agriculturalists, and maybe we could. You know, he says like they, they'll have to be disciplined enough to be in there for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can, you know, uh, cycle them in and out. But you know, it, the bunker itself will be continuously inhabited. And so the, the way he talks about this is not only is there uh, the dynamic of you know he's a, a wealthy white man in the West mm -hmm. uh, talking about you know. Hunter, contemporary hunter gatherers who are you know have been uh, pushed to you know their their lands have been destroyed and they've sort of pushed been pushed to the to the edge of uh, of survival, but it's it's just thinking about human beings in terms purely in terms of, of their just usefulness, mm. <laughs> you know not a, they're just kind of means to an end, 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's as if they don't have any value in and of themselves. And so, yeah, I feel like that is, is really quite pervasive in a lot of the rhetoric and uh, writing uh, or, or writings of uh, long-termists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because of course, uh, if we're talking also about subsistence farmers, hunter gatherers that currently exist right now, currently reside through those methods, uh, there are overwhelmingly people who are located in the in the global south, people of color, incredibly poor. And so it is just this rich white dude who basically wants to uh, put them in his simulation without any regard for their agency, their uh, well-being, none of that. And this is something that I, I feel like I feel like the reason why I found him very interesting is because he seems to be very forthright about how odious his beliefs are. But then I feel like other people who are in FHI or even supporters of this movement uh, are able to conceal some of those more blatantly racist and odious sentiments. But but of course, uh, there are others who also make it very clear that, yeah, at the end of the day, with something like climate change, for example, uh, overwhelmingly, that's going to hurt the poorest regions, poorest countries, poorest continents in the world, right? Mm -hmm. But then you have someone like uh, Nick Bexhead, who basically says, well, if we're really going by a long-termist view, then technically people in the global north are more valuable because they'll have a bigger ripple effect moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, it, it, you know, because uh, people in the global north tend to be more economically productive, and since economic productivity uh, is seen as this important component of trying to, uh, you know, further uh, technological and scientific quote unquote progress, uh, which then ultimately is going to enable us to colonize space. Uh, yeah, it's from this long termist perspective, from a grand cosmic point of view, where you know we could exist for who knows an enormous number of years in the future, ten to the forty. You know, that's when protons are expected to decay, if in fact they do decay, uh, or maybe much longer than that, maybe you know ten to the hundred years, which is, that's a one followed by a hundred zeros. It's an enormous number. It's just incomprehensible. Uh, when you t take this sort of grand view, then, um, you know, it's, it, there's, there's all sorts of problems today that, that really, you know, are, end up being minimized, end up being just imperceptible. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so, you know, for Beckstead, the claim is that, uh, because of this, it's more important to save the lives. We should prioritize saving lives of people in rich countries, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And it's it's a pretty, you know, repugnant uh, uh, statement. But I mean, it, it echoes a lot of claims that other long-termists have made. So, you know, Nick Bostrom in his uh, 2002 paper, which introduced the notion of existential risk, that's where he talked about dysgenic pressures. Um, you know, he, uh, talks about how, you know, even the worst atrocities in human history, the AIDS pandemic, Black Death, World War II, uh, these are, you know, they, they may have been very bad for the people immediately affected, mm -hmm. but ultimately they're just mere ripples on the great sea of life. They, they won't really change that much uh, or not to any appreciable extent, the total amount of happiness or suffering that will exist in the cosmos uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, elsewhere he he wrote, you know, the, the, some of these <laughs> catastrophes might be, um, I think the, the terms he used, the phrase he used was uh, giant massacres for man, but uh, small missteps for mankind. So it's, it's <laughs> you know, it's, it, for I think for many people reading this, that sounds very abhorrent. Um, mm -hmm. Like just just a, a deeply problematic way of thinking about the significance, the badness, the 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 uh, tragedy of these events. Uh, and I think you know in in this phase two 
of you know public outreach, a lot of these statements are very much concealed. <laughs> you know, they're they're mm -hmm. definitely not foregrounded because the effective altruists are very savvy when it comes to marketing and PR, and they know that people are going to be immediate f find these claims off-putting, and therefore are going to reject the the long-termist ideology. So they present it in a way that you know one might. Uh, I'm not sure it's it's very uncharitable, but a sort of sneaky way, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to uh, to persuade as many people as possible to sort of join uh, the movement. You know, I, I feel like a good example of this, which I'd like to to write about in the future, is this the first premise of long termism as it's been presented in the popular media over the past you know three weeks, which is that future people matter, and that sounds right. <laughs> Like, mm. I agree, future people should matter. And, you know, somebody, um, you know, being harmed uh, today versus uh, a thousand years from now, uh, I don't think the the harms are less purely by virtue of the fact that uh, they might exist in the, in the future in a thousand years or something. No, it, it all counts the exact same. But concealed within that... Uh, attractive looking premise is this idea that I was mentioning uh, before, that the more people you have in the universe, the better. So one way to, to care about future people, one way to save future people is to actually pluck them from the realm of mere possibility of non-existence, and then plop them in the, the, the realm of actuality. So that's one way to, so, so most people wouldn't think, uh, wouldn't interpret future people matter in that way. But for the long term is, you know, it's not just about ensuring that people have good lives in the future insofar as they exist, but it's ensure, it's taking actions now to increase the probability that as many people exist in the future as possible, assuming that they'd have half decent lives. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, again, another kind of, you know, I would describe it as, as a, a sort of sneaky tactic to present their views in a way that uh, makes them look much more reasonable than they actually are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And to me, a lot of this also seems like there's a lot of, a lot of corporate speak, a lot of even greenwashing that's involved. So uh, for example, like when William McCaskill, another member says, uh, you know, he's like, well, we should be very concerned about climate change. And ostensibly, everyone involved is very concerned about climate change. But then it also just shows like how there either is a a dearth of creativity that's, I mean, if whether it's, if it's intentional or unintentional, it doesn't really matter because uh, to use their framework, the outcome is the same. And so in this instance, how he talks about like, well, we're still going to need to heavily rely on fossil fuels because every time in the past there's been any sort of, you know, industrial revolution buildup of production, it's required fossil fuels. And, and to me, that I think also just exemplifies an issue that I have with this entire um, like Silicon Valley, uh, like cabal of people to where like, um, there are some obviously huge structural issues that exacerbate things like climate change that hurt all of us. And they're just like, yeah, but that's not that big of a deal in the long run. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so some, uh, have some long-termists have explicitly said, uh, examples are like Jan Talon, uh, the co-founder of, of Skype, uh, John Halstead is another one, uh, who's at the Future Pain Institute and did a lot of research for Toby Ord and, uh, Will McCaskill, as I understand it, um, they're explicit that, you know, climate change is not going to be an existential risk. And mm -hmm. uh, unless there's a runaway greenhouse effect, which seems improbable, doesn't seem like that's uh, that's going to happen. So yes, cl climate change is going to be devastating for, you know, a lot of people in the global south, really for everybody, but mm -hmm. Less so for billionaires, mm -hmm. a bit more so for people, in the, like average people in the global north, and then definitely, you know, individuals in the global south. But really, you know, it's it's not it's it's going to be a mere ripple in the grand scheme of things. You know, a small misstep for man. And so when you yeah, you know, when you combine 
this view that this claim that climate change isn't going to be uh, an existential risk with Bostrom's assertion that focusing our, to our top four global priorities should be reducing existential risk. Then you get this view that is ends up being kind of dismissive of climate change because, you know, they're bigger fish to fry. You know, there are actual existential risks out there <laughs> that and we should be prioritizing those. We should be worrying about those more than any kind of sub existential risk like climate change. So it's there is a kind of, um, you know, a, a, like I said, a kind of minimization of the importance of climate change, a, a, you know, almost dismissive attitude at times. And, you know, th this, this is mere hearsay, but somebody in the community <laughs> told me that when uh, Greta Thunberg, you know, became, started to become, you know, really huge and uh, um, Extinction Rebellion was, you know, grabbing headlines and so on, that people at FHI, like McCaskill, were kind of banging their heads against the wall, mm -hmm. upset that they didn't make more of about climate change. Why? Not because I think they changed their mind about how bad climate change is going to be, but for marketing reasons, because they, mm -hmm. they missed an opportunity to grab onto the coattails of, you know, Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion and increase their uh, visibility. So I, there, there is, I think with this, with this phase two, you know, the public outreach phase, there is much more discussion of climate change than there had been in the past. And I think that's for strate strategic reasons, because obviously everybody cares about climate change right now. Mm -hmm. uh, except our political leaders. Right, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and so you end up with, I think a lot of, the way I would interpret it is a lot of kind of empty talk from the long-termists. Like, yes, this is this is really terrible. And it's, you know, uh, McCaskill says in his, his new book, uh, What We Have the Future, you know, it's uh, a grave, you know, uh, injustice that people in the global south who are the least responsible for climate change will be the most affected, affected excuse me. Um, but, you know, in this same book, you know, uh, he's encouraging people to have more children, which doesn't seem like a particularly wise uh, exhortation right now. Mm. And yeah, and then he's saying, you know, uh, okay, yeah, I agree that we should stop extra extracting fossil fuels from the ground as soon as possible. Which which gives the impression that there's some kind of alignment between him and the environmentalists, but actually the reasons behind this are that it's really important we don't lose industrial civilization, and so if civilization does collapse, we may need some fossil some extra fossil fuels to burn again <laughs> to pollute our planet all over again in order to uh, reindustrialize, and once more that's ultimately important because we want to colonize space to create a bigger civilization. Ultimately, we want to convert planets into computronium to simulate you know, vast numbers of digital people. That's, mm -hmm. that's the, the best universe uh, imaginable for the long-termists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will say though, like in, in terms of increasing the birth rates, I, Whenever someone like Musk talks about the importance of having more kids and all that stuff, and of course, I, I don't think it's um, a, I, I don't think it's by mistake that he also talks about the importance of like how he's doing his part and having a bunch of kids and spreading his seed, because great stuff there. But, um, <laughs> but, but I think that like it's about well, we don't want we want certain people to have more kids. Because if you just look at total numbers, if you just look at the aggregates, um, November of this year, the planet is projected to have 8 billion people. That's 1 billion more than a decade ago. So population growth is still rather exponential, but of course it's mainly happening in, in Africa and Asia. So it's mm -hmm. not the right type of population growth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, there, definitely there are, uh, there's a whiff of eugenics uh, to it all. Mm -hmm. You know, McC McCaskill's clear in his book that he's talking about um, global population decline. Mm -hmm. 
But he also notes that, you know, his audience is probably like relatively affluent people in the global north. That's who he's talking to. Therefore, when he says you should have more kids, you know, mm. he's yeah. talking to like a mainly kind of a mainly white. I mean, the EA community is like overwhelmingly white. So he's talking to, to a, a mostly white you know, audience. Mm. And, you know, I think probably some of them would say, well, it's it's not a race thing. It's that um, what you don't want is people in uh, poor parts of the world uh, having you know more children because it's 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 you know those are the the, the regions of the world that are the, the least economically productive you know individuals have much fewer opportunities to get you know uh, in education in science and so on to to go to uh, you know join the the scientific workforce and help accelerate the rate of quote unquote progress but ultimately the the uh in practice it's the very same as just saying we want more white people. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. And so, exactly. yeah, I mean, Musk did, I remember there was one tweet where he specifically mentioned that CEOs uh, tend to have a very low, uh, to, a low number of children on, on average, mm. which, you know, did sort of single out a very particular uh, demographic by implication. The, the, he seemed to be saying that uh, more CEOs should be having kids. I guess because you know, well, I think a lot of them, you know, believe that in, in you know intelligence is uh, heritable as a result of because of a genetic component, which is just highly, highly dubious. I mean, there is obviously genetic component to everything, mm, but yeah. you know, yeah. um, it's it's you know the this yeah the fear that um, like going back to to Nick Bostrom's paper, the way he put it is you know less intellectually talented people are just having more kids, therefore the number of less intellectually talented people in the world will increase mm. and so yeah you, you still get you know th there are these uh you know echoes of the <laughs> eugenics program uh kind of all over the place in long-termism and certainly there's a genealogical connection speaking of of you know inheritance <laughs> mm. but yeah definitely genealogical connection from you know long-termism, existential risk, transhumanism, eugenics. Yeah, I mean, when it boils down to it, it's basically if you were to take an episode of T T T Tucker Carlson's show where he's going to talk about his anxiety over great replacement theory, and then you take the first snippet of him talking about like lowering birth rates and his concerns over that, and then you include maybe like uh, Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek over there, and then <laughs> you get to like the end of his... Uh, diatribe and conclusion so just a little bit of extra steps but kind of leads to the same overall worldview and so the, the final person that I, I want to end on this that I wanted to focus on because I think this guy he's, he's young he's only 30 years old uh, his Super Bowl or his uh he's the CEO of FDX crypto I mean his uh company bought out a bunch of ads during the Super Bowl they even had one with Larry David, which was disappointing to me as as a Curb Your Enthusiasm fan. I didn't put that that I didn't make that connection. I, I remember this now, but I didn't realize it was mm -hmm. it was FTX. Yeah, it was FTX. Yeah. So and of course, and that made me even more angry because I was like, well, of course, since it's Larry David, it's actually funny. So then more people are going to be interested in it. But anyway, <laughs> so Sam Bankman Fried, uh, you know, he also in 2020 was the second biggest donor to, to Biden behind only Michael Bloomberg. So this is someone who's definitely going to put his his toes into the, the waters of American politics. And so I, I, I'm just curious, like, what influence does, um, does something like cryptocurrency play in all of this? Like, is there like an overlap between like Future of Humanity Institute, long-termism, and then also like the proliferation of, of cryptocurrency? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know about the proliferation mm. of cryptocurrency. Well, I don't know, maybe so, because, you know, Sam Bankman fried is a long-termist. He's very much, you know, he's made his billions. I, I can't remember what it is, 30 billion, something like that, 20 billion. Mm. I mean, just an, an enormous, a vast uh, um, amount of money that he's made. And, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, it is it is Ponzi scheme-esque. Mm. And so there are a lot of people who don't have a lot of money 
and really lose out. There's also, you know, an enormous carbon footprint uh, um, to, you, you know, the cryptocurrencies. I know FTX has tried to offset uh, some of their, uh, uh, to, tried to, to, to become carbon neutral, but I'm skeptical about a lot of the carbon neutral uh, <laughs> uh, with that, I would recommend everyone watch John Oliver's recent episode over carbon offsets, and it will make you realize most of it's pointless. <laughs> it's just yeah. PR. Yeah. yeah, I watched that as well. It's it's, it's really a, a quite good uh, um, presentation of uh, mm -hmm. why a lot of it's just just grifting. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's just a big grift. But um, yeah, I mean, so Sam Bay Freeze is very much a long termist. Uh, this year, he funded the congressional campaign. Of somebody in Oregon uh, named Carrick Flynn, who uh, used to work at the Future Man Institute, and in fact, his campaign was run by somebody at the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, uh, Avital Balwit. And so, I, I can't. I mean, he got millions, you know, an enormous amount of money from Sam Bankman Fried, and uh, you know, uh, Bankman Fried has also talked about, you know, maybe donating upwards or perhaps more than a billion dollars in the upcoming uh, presidential election. And so, I mean, it's 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 good that he seems to be uh, more, uh, to, to lean a bit toward to the left mm -hmm. rather than the right. I mean, that's a good thing, but it is worrisome that uh, the, the, the ultimate aim of somebody like him is as far as I can tell, to take long term as, and place them in public office. Mm -hmm. So that was the goal with Carrick Flynn, and I have no doubt that that is not the last effort. And so I think people should expect there to be long termists eventually at some point uh, in the capital, uh, you know, governing the country. Uh, maybe at some point there will be. A president, you know, who's sympathetic with these views. Uh, I don't think that's sound. That's that's a wild, implausible thought. Uh, you know, one of the individuals who was very high up in the Biden administration, so very close to Biden, is uh, an individual named Jason Matheny, a very nice guy, uh, but he's he's someone who, as, as far as I know, is very much uh, a subscriber to the long-termist worldview. He was also a scholar for some time, uh, I think in maybe around 2009 or so at the F Future of Man Institute and, you know, wrote uh, and published a paper, which I think was maybe two years before that, which has sort of become so something of a canonical piece in the existential risk literature. So, I mean, he, you know, he was the director of IARPA, the sister organization of DARPA, which is much uh, more uh, well-known. Uh, but I mean, that's a really powerful agency. And then he ended up in the Biden administration. Now he's the CEO of Rand Corporation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, anyways, ultimately the point of this is, you know, Bankman Fried has a huge amount of money. He's looking to uh, shape the political landscape in the mold of uh, sort of long, according to the, the, the long-termist agenda. And I think that that is is quite worrisome. Mm. Uh, I think that you know it's it's nice that people are one good thing about long termism. I think is that it it does um, it, it does require uh, people taking seriously sort of long term thinking, mm. and it does promote a, a kind of long term thinking. And I I think we we live in a horribly myopic society yes, that is very true. yeah very much need more long-term thinking but long-termism goes so far beyond long-term thinking i mean it's an ideology not a sort of broadening of our field of vision it's a it's an ideology that again is based on this idea that bigger is better i mean that's the actual title of a subsection in the castle's book ultimately future people matter what does that mean it means we not only should make sure they have good lives or half decent lives at least, but that there should be as many as possible. That's mm -hmm. why we keep fossil fuels in the ground to rebuild industrial civilization. That's why underpopulation is a much bigger threat than overpopulation and so on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's worrisome if this particular ideology ends up becoming more powerful than it already is. And again, the UN 
you know, the summit for the future. McCaskill says that he's hoping that this will be uh, to long-termism what Earth Day in 1970 was to mm -hmm. environmentalism. Earth Day mainstreamed the modern environmental movement. He's similarly hoping that the summit for the future, uh, you know, maybe the declaration will encode certain, you know, long-termist principles in it. Uh, but at the very least, maybe it could just increase the visibility of this uh, ideology in the world. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm nervous about that. It makes yeah. me very anxious. <laughs> I, I mean, definitely. And also something to note is even though Bankman Freed is someone who positions himself on the left, he only contributes to Democrats. That's my understanding, at least so far, is that I also think people like him kind of exist to quash any sort of like progressive or leftist movement within something like the Democratic Party. So that's always where my concern is. I, I mean, even someone like Elon Musk started off as a staunch Democrat, huge Obama supporter. And then once the Democrats uh, make mild concessions to labor, you know, then suddenly no longer a big fan. But <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the Democrats are better than the Republicans. The Democrats, are, at least in my view, mm -hmm. uh, based, you know, given my particular political persuasions, uh, Democrats are not are not good they're better but they're they're kind of an awful but there's more group. of like an actual ideological battle within that party i think <laughs> that's mm -hmm. uh someone like bankman freed i think is looking to to shape towards his view rather than a more like pro-labor broadly egalitarian view <laughs> yeah, yeah i i i wouldn't argue with that mm -hmm. um i you know i think that's the so and also i mean you it, it's it's entirely possible that like musk he maybe changes his uh views Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe uh, obviously he's already been on Capitol Hill a number of times uh, testifying about, um, I can't remember the exact details, but, you know, basically regulations on cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, it's entirely possible that, you know, for self-interested reasons, like he uh, uh, comes to support certain politicians because they uh, are opposed to regulating uh, cryptocurrency. And, you know, ultimately, the, perhaps the, the the there's a more general point, which is just that we shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case that single individuals are able to accumulate so much vast wealth and have so much power in, in our societies. I mean, it's, it's anti-democratic. You know, we, we live in, in oligarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, know. no. And, and to me, this is why, like, ultimately, uh, this final point, why taxing billionaires at a much higher rate is so important is because I've argued especially in a country like the United States, we do have monetary sovereignty where we print and borrow our own currency, basically, right? Mm -hmm. It's not so much of, oh, we need to tax them so we can pay for certain programs. No, it's because if they gain more power, then they will shape policy. So it's not about mm -hmm. the money or the lack of funding for other programs. It's just the amount of power that they exercise on everyone else. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, Emil Torres, this was a great conversation. Uh, you can find their work on Salon. Specifically, the piece we talked about today was understanding long-termism, why this suddenly influential philosophy is so toxic, and of course, their forthcoming book, Human Extinction, A History of the Science and Ethics of Annihilation. All of this will be included in the description box below, but honestly, you know, I mean, thank you so much. This was very informative, and I, I hope more people, uh, Look, it's, you know, and a part of me kind of wants to be like, hey, you know how there are a lot of like Alex Jones followers who will be obsessed with uh, baseless conspiracy theories. I'm like, well, if you really want to look at something, if you really are concerned about billionaires shaping national and global policy, then uh, go down the long termism rabbit hole and do something to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, right. I agree. I agree. Well, Thanks so care. much for having me. This yeah, is a real pleasure. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye.